All right. Welcome, everyone. Everyone coming in. Welcome to a September event, the second September event. Just going to take our time, allow everyone to, to join the group. We've got Stefan on the other, the other screen. He's making himself a, a drink. Good evening there, Stefan. Good evening, everyone. I'm just finishing off here uh, a classic cocktail uh, made in a beautiful hotel in France, uh, beginning of last century, which is called the uh, French 75. It's a reference right. to uh, a kind of another war uh, bullet or something in 75. So it's where all these ex-military people uh, uh, that were in these bars enjoying. So basically, a French 75 is uh, 30 milliliters. I'm using the Rambla 41 gin. It's 30 milliliters, and I'm using the Rambla 41 vermouth, the first one I made. Another 30 milliliters yeah. of lemon. Yeah. Uh, once in your glass, just stir it. It's like a little bit the, the basic what we do with a dry martini. Then we're going to pour it in a cava glass, let's say halfway. And the beauty is to finish it off with bubbles. Bubbles, perfect. So your take on the French 75, the Spanish 75, if you will. Really, with a Spanish twist. Uh, all my products are very Mediterranean, so uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm very terroir-minded. So as well, my vermouth is my gins. Uh, I, I want them to smell like Spain and taste like the beaches uh, of the Mediterranean. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so we've got plen plenty of guys coming in now. We'll, we'll let them keep okay. coming in. Um, but but um, I've, I made my own uh, French 75 or Spanish 75. It's slightly different color to yours, but similar sort of thing. So welcome, welcome everyone. Um, this is the second uh, installment of Naked Wine September. Uh, welcome. Tonight we're taking a roller coaster ride through the world of spirits, all things cocktails, specifically gin, and we are we're here with master gin stiller Stefan Lisbon, an all-time legend of the Naked Wine family. So welcome, good evening, Stefan. There should be a lot of fun. Uh, I'm Matt. I'm Naked's newest wine guy. So please excuse me. My first session solo. Lucky you, Stefan. Um, <laughs> I'm, but I'm very excited about this session because when I'm not sipping wine, I'm not drinking wine, I am a massive cocktail enthusiast and all things spirit. So I uh, am, have been looking forward to this session uh, since we started thinking about September. Um, welcome are, to our- Cocktails are completely back. You know, the, the, the last five years, big easy clubs, uh, cocktailerias, and I'm very happy with yeah. that because it's a real Huge explosion yeah 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 uh welcome to our community thanks thanks for joining us uh you're filling in there you know what to do use the chat to say hi to each other tell us what you're drinking tell us how you enjoy spirits tell us your experiences um you can use the q a function um to pop uh, uh questions in as we go along and Stefan and I will use plenty of time at the end to go quick fire through all of your questions. We'll try and answer everything um, before we go. Um, and for, you, for those of you who purchased the September um, taste along pack, uh, I hope plenty of you did. Um, uh, you would have received a bottle of uh, Stefan's Rambler Mediterranean gin in the pack. Um, so you can fetch that now, fetch your favorite tonic, Stefan will be showing you his tips and secrets about how to make the perfect gin and tonic uh, shortly. Um, but first of all, we thought we'd get a bit back to basics with Stefan. Stefan, I'd love to start at the beginning to really find out, you know, what is gin? What makes gin gin? And maybe the, a bit of the history. And then let's talk about, you know, what, what makes your gin so unique, so special. Yeah. We need to start there. So we just mentioned that cocktails are back. Uh, what are they back from? You know, uh, where do we come from? 
So yeah, I'm going to give you a, a really quick uh, headlines introduction of the history of gin, uh, which I would call, for starters, kind of uh, maybe a bad history. Uh, gin, you will see. You will see how it goes. First of all, do you want me to share my screen, Stefan? I've got some some pictures. Do you want me to share my screen at this stage? I've got the pictures. Of, uh, actually, start yeah. in my home country, which is uh, Belgium, Flanders. Uh, I was born in Limburg, which is the area which we share also with Holland. We have Belgium, Limburg, and Holland, Limburg. That's the area where we had most of the Grand Genevas, which is the origin of gin. Now, the origin or the oldest recipe that was ever found was written in this beautiful book that you see there in Bruges in uh, 1266. First mentions of, actually in those days, and that's very peculiar, they were making uh, not Grand Geneva, they were making a kind of Geneva with the great distilled alcohol. It's actually later that it evolved in uh, cereal distilled alcohol. So, um, it was also part of Holland, uh, this culture of Grand Genevers. So, uh, the next step is when Willem of Orange, uh, first, they had a war going where Queen Mary sent uh, the British military to help them out. And their uh, Dutch courage was born. They were drinking like neat, this Grand Geneva, just to go into war, kind of like the Vikings, you know. Uh, having a, a shot, and there you go. After this war, uh, Willem of Orange fell in love with Queen Mary, or they didn't, but it was interesting for them to marry, and Willem of Orange moved into uh, England. First thing he did, he was Protestant. Uh, so Matt, we can look at the next image. Uh, he was a yeah. Protestant. And uh, the first thing that he was doing was raising all the taxes uh, on alcohol, especially the cognacs that came from France, and he took away taxes mm. of uh, distilling gin. So immediately loads of uh, gin distilleries were born in London. Uh, at that stage, one in every four persons was involved in gin, legally or illegally. What happened, this gin was, uh, it's the poor man's alcohol, no tax, it was the cheapest alcohol. They had this, this Tomcat cash machine in the wall where you could like lever and get a shot of pure gin coming out of the wall. This happened. People were in the streets, uh, drunk all the time. The dark ages came because of the gin. All right, we're going to make... Mother's uh, ruin. <laughs> uh, we're going to make a next step. You know, this is the, the, the gin. Uh, let's say ne it was never considered as a quality spirit. It was never considered like a cognac. Or, but it was homemade in Britain, so people loved it. Hundred years later, uh, there's uh, the colonization, the war, we go to Africa, and England sends its British uh, military over there. Uh, the, the, they were struggling with malaria, everybody knows that. That's where the gin tonic was born. Uh, the quinina, uh, they mixed it with gin. They had to take this quinina uh, to mix it uh, with gin and with tonic. That's where they really, the gin tonic was born. Here you see, uh, a bunch of uh, pretty brave uh, British uh, military warriors getting ready uh, to kill the enemy. This was the drill, you know, have a shot of gin before you jump in there. There must be something with gin that it makes, uh, that makes you able to go into war. <laughs> so the gin tonic war that took a few hundred years, you know, with a lot of success, uh, especially, of course, in England. Uh, and then we go to the next uh, capital, which is uh, the Roaring Twenties, beginning of last century. Uh, prohibition starts, nobody can get hands on alcohol anymore, so the Mafia takes over, especially in Chicago. Uh, and there you had North Chicago, South Chicago, the, the rich Mafia. They had whiskies coming in from England, Malta still floating on the sea, getting on the beach of uh, the US. And in the South Chicago, they had like the poor mafia. They were actually doing gin, <laughs> of, of course, what else? Uh, this picture is actually in the middle of this room, you can see a bathtub. Well, that's a concept of making gin in the roaring twenties. A bathtub gin is nothing more than 
you go to the pharmacy, buy 50 liters of pure chemical alcohol, uh, our, gel, our alcohol is natural. You buy the chemical alcohol, throw it in your bath, don't forget to put it in the stove, you throw it in your bath, throw some juniper berries in it, you leave it macerating for an hour, two hours, and then you open the tap, water runs in, you mix it, 40% alcohol, 60% water, and they used to bottle it uh, and sell it in their bars. Never in history so many people died of alcohol and poisoning. Uh, it was really bad. This period for us today is very important because in this period, the cocktails were born. Actually, a cocktail was mm -hmm. born to hide the bad quality of gin, of bad spirit. Uh, today we make, uh, you know, uh, wonderful magic cocktails uh, with loads of ingredients, high complexity. We can do a lot with cocktails, but the way it was born really was to hide that bad quality gin. Huh? So how do we come to a revival of gin and how do we come to a revival of cocktails and speakeasy clubs? I th the first brand probably uh, that took off with the concept of a more aromatic gin, a more richer gin, because a gin, as we all know, the London dry gin, it's very simple, very vertical, gives a few peaks of aromas and it's gone. Uh, now we have a new age of gin uh, where we really are part of. We are looking for a rich experience in aromas and flavors because that's the big world of distilling. That's where you get all these aromas, but you can flavor. So uh, the Bombay Sapphire was like the first brand or the first uh, more complex gin. Uh, they were watching different distillations, macerations of the botanicals. And they were finding a way to extract these aromas, which you can find today, not only in gin, anywhere. Aromas uh, is in a lot of food, in a lot of uh, drinks. Coca-Cola, Fanta, everything has aromas, which are distilled, which come basically by distilling from alcohol that you have these essences. So there comes in our gin also, uh, what we call today the new era of aromatic gins. There are very classifications. The European community recommends uh, 50 kilos of juniper berry and 1,000 liters of alcohol. It's virtual nothing. There are no rules, really. Uh, it's a little bit the Wild West gin and vermouth, by the way. It's not protected, really. There is no nobody that tells you, really, how you should make a gin. Everybody agrees you need uh, to have uh, juniper berry in your gin. I bet there's going to come a gin without juniper berry at some stage, but we'll get there. There's no defined, there's no defined um, recipe, minimum recipe for gin. Is it, is it, there is one for London dry gin, isn't there? But that's a sort of, that's a protected, I think, recipe. But um, in not, terms of just general gin. I know it's only a protection in England and uh, England is working very hard on getting international protection. They're going to be mm. the first one to protect the concept of a London dry gin, which is very basic. It is just one distillation of your botanicals, uh, and that's it. So you have your, your right. alabic, uh, you put uh, your botanical choice. Normally it's only two, three juniper berry, one or two botanicals, one distillation and what runs out, that's considered to be a London dry gin. It's actually what they will, uh, what they will protect and it's gonna be protected soon. And that will open the door but there's going to be a lot of discussion of what is really yeah. a gin. In our mm -hmm. case, and uh, if you show me the next picture, that's where we're going. We're going for a complete new Wow. Yeah. Uh, it's not about the simple gin tonic. It's not about malaria anymore. It's about enjoying life. It's about having a good experience. Uh, in our yeah. case, uh, Rambla 41. Matt, I think I'm going to jump into immediately and to explain my little baby here, uh, because she is uh, an example of this new type of aromatic gin, if you think so. Shall absolutely. I immediately? Yeah. So. Yeah, I'll... I would love to hear. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. By the way, we are in Barcelona. I just had uh, to wipe my head a little bit. It's hot. It's very hot here. We're still at 27 degrees. Is it? We're at 62% humidity and uh, we are loving our life here. All right. Wonderful. Barcelona, Rambla 41. 
my whole idea, uh, I got it. Uh, I was living in the Priorat wine region. Uh, I was exporting Priorat wines involved in some production. I'm doing a cava, uh, one of my cavas you can find also in the Naked Wine Shop, which I used also to make uh, the French 75. Um, a Flemish, my Flemish partner, uh, friend, uh, he was actually started up a distillery with Mr. René Barbier. René Barbier is kind of the, the god of the Priorat. He's like the, the, his wine, Clos Mogador is the benchmark. Uh, it's a very well-known person. And he started up together with my partner, Philip, uh, a distillery to make a grappa of his wines, of the lees of his wines. Yeah? Once this was going, Philip, uh, he wanted more. Uh, he met me uh, and he got more. <laughs> uh, he asked me to, to export this uh, grappa into Europe. And then I remember very well, it was like, I don't know, the 23rd of August, uh, six o'clock in the afternoon, uh, my village uh, is very small, 3,000 inhabitants, and we only have, let's say, eight bars and three shops. Uh, that's it. So I remember that afternoon walking to the bar to meet Philip. He was sitting there with a beer, up, sunglasses, feeling great. I arrived and he said, Stefan, what do you think if you make a gym? I said, yes, man, let's dedicate a gym to Barcelona. You know, Barcelona is the, the capital of gin tonic. It's, uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's considered as the main city of, uh, of gin tonic. So I had this idea, I was working in wine, you know, I never worked in spirits. Uh, so how, how do I handle this? You know, but I was very eager to put in everything I have, everything I learned in wine business, in the market, what people like, what they don't like. Uh, and there was a new trend going, which is gins, which is actually from my uh, home country, you know. Uh, I grew up with Grand Geneva. I, 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 I was brushing my teeth with Grand Geneva when I was six. Well, because you're from, you're, you're from Belgium, aren't you, Stefan? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I am, but uh, uh, more, more than 32 years already, much more than half of my life I'm living here. Barcelona, so, resident so and inhabitant, and native. I, up, uh, I speak yeah. much more Catalan than, uh, than Spanish, actually. Uh, Oh, yeah. I love living here, especially because of these aromas, especially because of yeah. the beautiful ingredients that you have here. It's a beautiful warm climate. This the Mediterranean is, the Romans already knew that. They, they took the entire Mediterranean. Why? Well, uh, and that fits, you know, the Priorat. Uh, they make, then you can make wines of up to 20% alcohol. It's uh, only 30 kilometers from the Mediterranean Ooh. Sea, mountain range. Uh, microclimate, uh, very, very low production, very dry, slate stone, uh, no nutrition. The vines have to dig like 35 meters deep in between the slate stone to get the nutrition. Yeah. But the complexity of these grapes, and not only the grapes, uh, uh, lemon, the wild uh, herbs, fruits, yeah. everything which grows in the Priorat terroir everything. has a very high intensity of flavors and complexity. Mm -hmm. So for me, the idea of making a terroir gin was immediately clear. You know, making a gin, a wine-minded gin, uh, was very clear. Must say that Eamon also loved that direction of where I was going when we started off with the first Rabla 41, which was really a big mm -hmm. adventure because uh, you guys are a wine company. You know, there are no spirits. So yeah. How would a spirit? It's our first spirit. Yeah. You know, in a wine company. So. Amazing. What were we distilling? Listen, I invite you to come over to the Priorat. If you walk in these mountains, you will touch wild fennel, you will touch rosemary, you will touch thyme. It's all wild growing there. Uh, of course, I needed these ingredients, these terroir ingredients, you know. It's dedicated to Barcelona. It's not only the mountains, it's all, also the sea. And we have here these, these pine forests that come all the way to the sand beaches. And then you have the blue ocean, uh, the blue Mediterranean in front of you. The smell of these pine trees, pine, you know, is very Mediterranean. So we started to distill pine buds, very small buds, uh, which is one of the ingredients that we also use in uh, Rabla 41. Uh, from there on, we've been distilling everything that grows there, uh, from figs uh, to almonds. Uh, we've done green almonds to have more bitterness. And we fell on the almonds. Uh, one of the distillations in Rambler 41 is also almond. 
for all the people that are allergic to almond, don't worry. This is a destiny. There is no rest of any almond in there. Actually, <laughs> just for you, you should try it because now you can taste almond. Okay. Having problems with your allergy, which is a good. No, thing. no anaphylactic shocks with the gin. No. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, this gin, as you can hear, is very complex. Uh, what I said before about the London Drive, which is vertical, this is horizontal. You know? This has body, yeah. it has length, you know, intensity. Uh, and that was what I was looking for an experience. You know, this is not, we, we all get drunk when we're 18, going out after a school. <laughs> Uh, and, and we all have Maybe a bit older. It's a terrible headache the next day because we're drinking bad gin like they have been doing for three, four hundred years already, mankind. We're not going to go. <laughs> it's a tradition. Here. And, you know, it's a joy. You can enjoy it on yourself. You can enjoy it with your love, with your friends, with your family. It's a very gentle alcohol, uh, a great distilled. It's yeah. not that natural. A great distilled alcohol has just that. Yeah. Know, that more elegance when it runs down, you know. Uh, I don't know if you have. I was going to say that 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 that's the fascinating thing about this gin for me, and what I love about this is it's so compatible with the wine trade, isn't it? Because after they've made the wine and they have the the old um, grapes, the the pressings of the grapes, you come in, take those pressings, and then distill them. So it's a very complete process. You're not wasting anything, um, and you're. You're taking the natural softness of the grapes and, and turning them into something else and I, and I guess I wonder I wonder whether you'd agree but I think that's the the, the very um the popularity of gin is because there are so many different permutations of it and and you can you can take your local environment and put it in a bottle really can't you I think there it all switched you know the new era it's, it's just stepping out of that simple Grand Geneva ID, that simple juniper berry as a main protagonist. Yeah. Uh, today, you know, my gin, uh, our gin, your gin, because you angels made it all happen. So it's also your gin. Yeah. It's probably much more a gin from the angel than from me. Uh, and thank you very much, by the way. Uh, this gin, you know, we're looking for uh, uh, how, how it really brings you to the Mediterranean, you know. I, I always hope, like, people close your eyes, you know, when you're enjoying, you're sitting on your sofa, put some salsa music on, have a sardine or some berberecho or something, mm. and, and you can picture yourself in the Mediterranean, you know. That, that was a, you know, being able to put the feeling and emotion and origin in a spirit, to be able to reach your house, your living room, uh, with my yeah. poetry of gin, that makes me very yeah. happy. So, mm. uh, so it's, it's now a good chance to um, explain how we should, how you would make the perfect gin and tonic with this gin while we keep talking. You, uh, you, you already got me, Matt. Uh, actually, I already started. Is that, is that what you're doing? You're, you're yeah. preparing your glassware, aren't Neither you? It is yeah. a very, 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 very important step of uh, making gin tonic. Filling the glass. The first, the first step. Gin is 40% alcohol and 60% water. It's mm -hmm. my water. It comes from my well into the, the state stone of the Priora. It's a high mineral, vigorous water, which I need to carry the structure of all these aromas. Yeah? Uh, as a London dry gin has peaks in its aromas, I work only with balance. There is no peak of juniper berry, no peak of citric, no peak of lemon. I bring them all together, like a cocktail. You know? That's why I believe a simple gin tonic with Rambla 41 is not a simple gin tonic. It's a cocktail. It's a, it's a party drink. So, okay. I have 60% water in my gin. Why do you have to chill your glass? Because I don't want water in my gin tonic. The colder your glass is, the less ice will be used, if the less water that will arrive in your gin tonic. You can see how, how it really gets cold. We're here now at, at about 26 degrees, so temperature or your gin tonic, once I serve it, it will drop immediately two, three degrees. We need to be fresh. we need it. Okay, at this stage, when you're chilling, I'm gonna give you a unique tip of making a unique gin tonic, never, never done before. 
you heard okay. something, uh, uh, about it's a wine minded gin. I don't know if you have some red wine in your house, man. Uh, Oof. Me? You, As a wine bar? No, you know, none. I make it with the wine, you know. Uh, he's going to do a classic standard. I'm just going to add a little bit of wine, which is made from the Grenache grape, which is actually the grape. Grenache. Still. I'm going to go and quickly find some Grenache. I'll be back. So, I put some Grenache wine into my glass, which I am chilling. You can do it like educated with spoon, or you can do it in the salsa version and have some fun. Wow, there you Just go. Shake it. Shake it, shake it, shake it. Very good when your guests are out. How much am I putting in of the Grenache? You will grab How it. Much? All right, so. You see what happened? I just put in a little bit of red wine from the shelf, and it, and and my chill, the, the the chillness is already gone. So please chill it. You know my experience: the more north I go in Europe, the less ice people want in their gin tonic. It must be of the low temperatures. Uh, it must yeah. be of the culture. But uh, please serve it. Serve it really cold, ice cold. So there you go. Plenty of ice. Don't scrimp on the ice. Okay. We got the glass chilled with the wine and with the ice. The ice diluted, so we have liquid. This liquid, liquid, we're gonna throw away. Yeah, because we only are giving, we only are preparing the glass. Yeah? Okay. So. Just washing it in red wine. Now at this stage, yeah, I, I like to add my garnish before we will fill it up with, uh, with ice uh, even more. Garnish, uh, listen, citrix, anything you want. Uh, grapefruit, uh, orange, the peel, the fruit, lime, lemon. Uh, they never do any harm to a gin and tonic. So there you're always good. Follow your own taste. Uh, to make this a little bit more interesting, I'm gonna put a grape, a red grape in here. Because it is a grape, it's still nice. Nice. It is an element that you can use. You can put it entirely, cut it up. I like a few pieces, yeah? And in this yeah. case, uh, uh, I'm gonna add some orange, yeah? Uh, one orange wet. I'm gonna add some orange too. Um, so just, um, Stefan, would you, you add the slice of citrus or the peel or, or, or uh, the I'm gonna finish off with the, with the lemon peel, yeah? Uh, but I'm gonna yeah. put the orange inside. So the peel or the fruit, you know? The fruit uh, just, uh, accompanies your gin tonic. The peel is going yeah. to give this little extra acidness to it. The oil. Yeah. Which, which gives it the more okay. impressive feeling. So the fruit is in there, yes. and now you're going to top it off completely with as much as possible ice. Right. Okay, so we got a food. So now, Matt, smell this glass. Oh, amazing. And we haven't put anything in it yet. You know, there is still no gin, no tonic made, but this is what we're going to start with. This yeah. is the taste of our gin tonic. You like yeah. it? It right. smells amazing, yeah. So, now we're going to go to the gin and the tonic. The gin, uh, normal brands, they recommend 55, 60 milliliters. We did a lot of tests, and actually we went down to 35, 40 milliliters. Again, I'm looking for really? brown ones, not looking for... Uh, the, peach, the, the peach of the juniper, or no, I'm looking for balance here. So, we're going to add in this ah. tonic 40 centimeters. And there is a, a, a way in cocktail we count in our head seconds uh, to measure the milliliters. Mm -hmm. You can use a jigger, it's always good to use a jigger, then you're more or less once you're into it after your third or fourth gin tonic, you can leave the jigger behind uh, <laughs> and you can do it like me. Yeah, a bit more or less. You keep counting too many seconds. 21, 22, 23, 24. Here we go. 40 milliliters. Okay. 40. So now you see that the, the, the ice is already going down. You see what's happening. So I, 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 I like to add more as much as I can. You know, it has to stay cold. So now it's time for the tonic. <laughs> Which is really a personal choice. Uh, in my case, I recommend 
an, an Indian tonic, you know, with Kivina. Uh, that's what matches, and that's how it designed. I use Fever Tree because you can find it anywhere. Uh, and inside yeah. that, really, personally, from me, I love Ledger's, uh, the Tangerine version. Ledger's is one of these uh, beautiful, adventurous British people that discovered uh, Kivina uh, ages ago in South America. Uh, and this, 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 this tonic I say I like very much. Now, more and more tonics are born every week on the market. Try them out. Look what your taste is going for. Start off with the neutral. I use this because it's a little bit less sugar. It's natural killing. Schweppes is not bad tonic. It's a good tonic. Huh? Uh, you can use it. This intensity of the gin will win over any tonic practically. So, to add the tonic, I'm going to use the spoon. Yeah, normally, it's a twisted spoon, and the idea behind that is that you break the bubbles, the carbon of your tonic, which I don't believe is really necessary. Actually, tonic, when it comes in touch with alcohol, will go down four to six bars of uh, pressure of carbon, just because of the chemical chem combination. So I have a straight spoon. Yeah? You can use like okay. a, a Japanese chopstick or whatever you want. Chopstick. What's going to happen? Oh, right. Uh, one of these wounds, if you don't have a spoon at home, yeah, you must have one of these uh, sushi things. This works perfectly. You don't have a spoon, you use it. Yeah, and it works. I'm going to show you. What's going to happen? The top uh -huh. runs down this uh, chopstick. It's going to go underneath the alcohol, and it's going to push up the alcohol. You know that when you open a bottle of wine, it comes in contact with oxygen. And aroma yes. start to open. It's exactly the same with spirit. So when you serve it like this, the first second that you bring this gin and tonic to your lips, and you will smell all its aromas. That's that's the moment you know this gin was mm. huge. The, that's the, the first hit. Yeah. So give it love when you make it. Use the Japanese stick or any other stick, and just pour slowly okay. tonic into your glass. As you've all seen, I'm using a wine glass, uh, which I like very much. As I said, it's a wine-minded gin. Yeah, so you, you like using a wine glass. I, I've, I, I've sort of gone back to using tumblers, I have to say. I don't know why. I, I think it's just an aesthetic <laughs> thing, I'm I, sure. Aesthetically, I love the glass you're working with, you know? But here... Yeah, it's a nice one. Uh, we, we stay in our world. We stay in our story. With the aromatics. Yeah, yeah. I like that very much. You know? See, I threw away all the liquid, as you can see in Matt's g and He threw away... It's a bit pink all, still. All that wine yeah. got stuck in the eyes underneath. And it, and it starts to give this beautiful natural rosé color, you know? Now... Yeah. We got a gin tonic. No, no, no. Wow. Now, we got a cocktail with two ingredients, gin and tonic. Mm. Oh, that's what it's all about. That's really good. You know, this is, it, yeah. it enters very smooth. You know, it really is very pleasant. It opens, uh, the citrix, they open in the side. Then these herbs come out, rosemary, thyme, and you finish off in the back, uh, with a fruitiness. Uh, don't forget, we distill red grapes. Our base alcohol is not neutral. It's a kind of a grappa, yeah. which has already high quality of aromas. It's all in here, you know? This gin provides you a big palette of aromas, a very wide experience of uh, smell and taste of the Mediterranean, you know? That was really the goal that we were going for. That was really the product uh, that we wanted to make. You know? Yeah. Wonderful aromatics. I apologize to everyone. I've left too much Grenache in this one. It is a lovely color. It tastes, the aromatics are fantastic though, Stefan. It really, the, the gin is a really sort of, uh, yeah, it's hugely aromatic. It goes really well with the tonic. I used Mediterranean fever tree. Fever tree, Indian, I think works really well, but you're right. There's been an explosion of tonics recently and, and it's about finding new ones and trying things out. Uh, lots of people showing love for Schweppes in, in the in the chat. And Schweppes is a really solid tonic, I think, and, uh, you know, works really well with lots of gins, doesn't it? Yeah, fantastic, great, wonderful. Well, you know, it's for me, the Vinic character really comes through. 
there are other gins on the market uh, that are working with uh, great distilled alcohol, as base alcohol, but they stick to yeah. the standard model of starting off. It's like cognac. They, they have a grape, which is a neutral grape. has no uh, very little aromas. After distilling, all the aromas are gone. So they have a wide, distilled, clean, pure alcohol. Then they're going to add yeah. the botanicals. I already start with a rich alcohol. You know, and that makes, uh, you know, when, when, when Eamon uh, found me uh, here in Barcelona, when we started up the project, and I was also thinking, you know, whoa, this is the UK. This is London Drive. How oh, these are the gin drinkers, the classical. And, you know, um, I'm very, very surprised, very pleased with the really enormous success we had in Naked Wines with our gin. And it pleased me so much that I see so many UK people loving a Mediterranean gin, you know, because to be honest, on a professional side, in the professional market in the UK, uh, it's, it's very difficult to get in. It's very difficult to get distributed. And the classical sure. way of approaching spirits is, this is not gin. This is not a London dry gin. You know? We don't want this. Uh, yeah. But you guys, you people, you are the proof that you do want a Mediterranean gin. Absolutely. It's about getting people to taste it first. And when they do, they see the quality and, they, uh, you know, everyone's loving it. Um, Let's move on. That's a delicious gin and tonic. Let's talk about the next cocktail we're going to do. Um, let's speed through that one. Um, but we're, you, talk, you mentioned the sort of prohibition era of cocktails, the golden age of cocktails. And this next one, um, the South Side uh, that you're going to make for us, is, is very much from that era, isn't it? It's a historic cocktail uh, from a time when gin was still a, a, a rough, poor spirit in America. And uh, the cocktail was very much dressed up to, to, to sort of take the, take the rough booze away, basically. Exactly. They, were, they were all the time looking, you know, how can we make the drink excited? How, what can we do with it? Actually, that's what the book said. This South Side was the favorite cocktail of Mr. Al Capone. Uh, that's what the story says. Okay. Uh, okay, what do we need? Uh, for the starters, uh, there is uh, shaking and stirring. Everybody knows James Bond. Yes. We will we will get in there later. Uh, but the shaking and the stirring is very important. Biggest difference with shaking, of course, you're going to dilute ice uh, and, and you're going to lower the alcohol level of your cocktail, uh, depending how how you make it on starters. When you're stirring. You're going to look much more for an emotion. You know, you're going to look much more that the aromatic molecules start to interact, start to combine among them. You know? mm. For me, that is uh, actually, I must say this, uh, we do this with this gin. It is our biggest secret. Uh, we open the molecular structure of our base alcohol. Once we have our base alcohol distilled, we give it the treatment where this structure really starts to open. It's like Ferrand's Adria kitchen. If you have a spoon with a, a foam of uh, mango, uh, there's no mango, it's only foam, you know? You get the spoon in and it's wow, an explosion of mango taste. Where does this come from? It's only foam. It's just because of this aromatic molecular structure, which is wide open, you know? The, the, the probability that an aroma uh, molecule enters in one of your taste buds is five to 10 times higher uh, by opening that structure. That's what we do with our base alcohol. I'm not going to tell you how, because it's our secret. No. Secret, trade secret. In, in the mouth field, you know. The, another thing is, and people must have noticed, we, we almost do not filter. We do a very light, non-chill filtering. What does that mean? Uh -huh. uh, when you chill down your uh, spirit or your wine, because in wine, it's done a lot also. Um, and you filter your wine cold. With cold temperature, the esters start to combine. Yeah? That's what happens some, a lot of times. We bottle our gin crystal clear. It arrives two months later in the UK. Uh, a lot of times, we, in the beginning, we were delivering in the winter. Colder temperatures and the esters start to combine. When you filter, the esters don't pass, and you got a crystal clear gin. 
We don't want to do yeah. this because we noticed that we lose up to 30% of the intensity of aromas of our testament, of our gin. Flavor, yeah. And I, I, you know, uh, I must say, uh, the first year, you know, this cloudy gin, uh, this uh, uh, white things sometimes floating in there. Uh, I can't do this with any client in the world. There is no supermarket, there is no distributor. No. <laughs> They wouldn't have it. And why not? You know, you. I mean, you want you want you want the the, uh, the Maserati, or you want to drive in a Honda. City? Yeah. <laughs> this is the Maserati. Yeah. Right? And and you have it in red wine. You know, all these precipitations, and nobody complains about it. But this is crystal clear, and uh, our gin sometimes is a really beautiful cloud. I saw it in, yeah, so if you, going in my bottle uh, at, at uh, some Christmas uh, evening. <laughs> yeah. So, so if if um, everyone, if anyone keeps this in the freezer, you'll often see you'll see this go cloudy very lightly. But it's absolutely nothing to worry about. You often see it. Um, there's plenty of whiskey as well that's not not um, gel filtered, and um, it's a completely natural thing. And there's much more going on in there as a result. It hasn't been stripped out. Yeah. No, this, uh, that, actually, it's very well known in malt whiskies, but it's not crystal clear yeah. and you don't see it, uh, but they do it a lot. So let's go to the south side. Uh, first, I'm going to start yeah. with fresh mint. Uh, it's a kind of, uh, you could say, a variation of the Mofito, although it would be the other yeah. way around. The Mofito came later than the south side. So about six leaves uh, of fresh mint. Okay. Very important with the mint. Uh, also, when you make a Mofito, to get the aromas out of this leaf, never cut it with a knife, mm. never smash no. it, never kill it. You know? Maybe a tear. Treat it like uh, like you would make a tea out of it. You know, we need we need the aromas. We don't we don't want it to oxidate. You know, it happens with all uh, with salads with uh, all kind of fresh herbs. When you cut them, especially with metal knives, you can provoke oxidation and you lose uh, uh, quality of aroma in it. So now we're going to go for mm. 60 milliliters of our Rabla 41 gin. Uh, 60? Okay. Yeah, jigger is normally 50, so uh, a jigger and a little bit. Yeah, mine's up. 50 on one side, 25 on the other, so. Okay, now we're going to go for to make it up. of uh, lime, fresh squeezed lime juice. I can tell you uh, more or less. Half a line is uh, ten, well, 10 milliliters. Yeah? So you can squeeze, yeah. it, squeeze it, or you can buy this uh, Brasso Mexicano, how they call it, which we use in cocktails. And if you do three half yeah. uh, lines, you will come to the same uh, amount. Depends on the freshness. Yeah. Depends, uh, it's no. Yeah, I, I squeezed mine earlier, and it's funny how accurate one whole lime is. It's exactly the right amount every time, I find. But exactly. there we Sometimes go. Sometimes we have small limes. Yeah, it's a little bit. But also, you know, make a cocktail for yourself. Repeat it once in a while. And after a few, you, you will pin it down. OK, so now uh, we're going to go for some sugar syrup. This is a bottle. Yep. Of, but it's very easy at home to make sugar syrup. Uh, <laughs> I made my own here. Oh, so, there we go. I will never buy it, guys. Yeah. So it, don't buy Monin sugar syrup or any of those bottles um, because you just cast the sugar uh, uh, 50 grams. So it's two to one sugar to water. So you boil a kettle, um, measure out 50 grams of caster sugar, pour in the freshly boiled kettle in a jam jar I always use, put the top on, give it a good shake until it's all dissolved. Let it cool and you've got sugar syrup it'll last in the fridge for three weeks or something like that yeah and you can have some fun you can use not for this cocktail probably but you can use brown sugar you can use honey you can use all sorts and to, to, to add a bit of complexity to your cocktails how much um, sugar are you putting in stefan okay so uh we're stirring all the ingredients how, how much there. sugar and uh we're gonna stir give it turn it around move it let it move are you gonna shake it I, I will do. How, how much sugar syrup should I put in? 15 milliliters. 15. One five. Yeah. So we're, we're doing 60 gin, 30. Uh, and uh, of 15 lunch, of the sugar. Of, uh, the syrup. 
Sexto versículo. I'll touch it in a shape mine because I think it, the, the ice bruises the, the mint leaves and releases all of the flavor. What do you, what do you think? Well, both, both ways it works, you know. Uh, yeah. let's say that probably mine is going to be a little bit stronger than yours because you're going to shake and, and ice is going to go down a little bit much more. But it's yeah. good to have this, this you, you know, it's not about the alcohol shouldn't uh, uh, molest you, you know? the alcohol really should be should be smooth so it's a little bit uh, I like it this way because this is more like this tea concept you know how you get these flavors yeah. alcohol now getting the flavors out of this fresh milk no one before anyone asks me on the chat to do some Tom Cruise uh, impressions or flair or anything like that we'll leave that to Stefan after he's had his last cocktail in this case, we're going to use a, a, a strainer. Uh, well, um, what do you call this? A colador in Spanish. Matt will tell me what's the English name of this. Uh, uh, yeah, a fine strainer. A fine yeah, strainer. Absolutely. Right, we're going to use that to serve in a chilled cocktail glass. Here goes our south side. It's really important to chill your cocktail glasses, isn't it? Either in the freezer or with some ice and water. And uh, if you're going to shake it, you can get all of the ice crystals as well in the glass. So you can use one of these little sieves or uh, to just to keep the little shards of ice and the, the mint out. There we go. Okay, in this case, uh, I think you should finish off the glass with a nice fresh mint, mint this. So here we have salsa, iconic uh, cocktail. Uh, I love it. It really it works is. with uh, this type of gin. Again, you know, because you have the lime. It's, there's a lot of acid in there, but we have this sweet of grape of the finnick character of this gin, and that really gives it a beautiful balance, a beautiful combination uh, coming together. Cheers, everyone. That's delicious. That's delicious. And if you're a fan of mojitos, but you want something a bit shorter and stronger, like a daiquiri, it sort of it's between a mojito and a daiquiri sort of thing, isn't it? Yeah, mm. yeah daiquiri. The That's delicious. Feeling, you know, it's, it really jumps out. You know? And notice our gin is still there. You know, you can feel that, Matt. No, that uh, the Rambla Forty One. Yeah. If you use, with all respect, the Tanqueray beef feeder. It's hard to recognize that gin in a cocktail like this, you know, but I like mm. it's that really that smooth and really comes through, you know, this uh, really supports yeah. uh, all these flavors. You know? Delicious. Thank you, Stefan. Wonderful. That is excellent. And um, we'll try and get all of the uh, recipes on the website. Hopefully uh, somebody behind the scenes can make that happen uh, where we'll put them, but we'll, we'll find a, a way to link them and put some of the recipes we're doing, but we're recording this. So anyone can watch it back and make the drinks at a later date. Um, just so we can make sure we get to plenty of questions at the end. Um, let's um, press on. That's delicious. But I wanted to talk about something else that you make for Naked, uh, which is a pre-bottled Negroni. Um, so tell us about this. Uh, you know, how, how is it different to a normal Negroni? Does everyone know what a, a normal Negroni, what is in a normal Negroni to start? So maybe you should start there. Well, it is, it is a very well-known classical cocktail that was born in Milan uh, also more than 100 years ago. Uh, it's a survivor. It's it's one of these cocktails that that never get off, off the scene, really. You know, Negroni no. uh, as real fans. It's all about bitterness, uh, Negroni. How do I come to this idea? I could tell you exactly. Uh, I was in uh, the city of uh, Romeo and Julia, uh, which is called. Uh, come on, help me. Verona. 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 Yes, baby. I was in Verona <laughs> and I was sitting in Verona on a terrace. I don't know if you've ever been there, but you have this old Roman arena, which is amazing. You know? uh, I had a meeting, I don't know, uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, 11. I'm not an early bird. Uh, finished the meeting, 12 o'clock, 12.30. Before I went to my next city to visit a client, 
I walked over that square and I said, I had to sit down, you know, on a terrace. I ordered the Negroni. And this Italian waitress, she started to smile when I ordered the Negroni. She said like, yes, you know, we love that you ordered a Negroni, that you really get into our culture and our feeling. She brought me this Negroni, you know, it was my operative. I enjoyed it so much. I, I, I can't, you know, get away of the image anymore of sitting there, of what I smelled there, what the light, you know, the feeling I had. You know? So I had to make a Negroni. Uh, now, what is a Negroni? Actually, it's quite simple. It's gin, uh, Campari. Uh, these are really Campari. ingredients. Huh? Um, so that's how they make the cocktail Negroni. With, uh, vermouth, of course, we are <laughs> forgetting gin. Vermouth. Red vermouth. Uh, yeah. Actually, an equal uh, uh, proportion. You third, can third, make third, yeah. two vermouths. Uh, for naked whites, you know, this, this uh, orangey uh, vermouth and this more fruity, red, red, deep, a little bit more aged vermouth. Yeah, and uh, we also have the gin, you know, in this case, I like very much uh, Lottiferre, which is uh, another uh, Ramla 41 gin, which I used to make uh, this Negroni. Now, I didn't mix these products together. I built up a new batch of a Negroni. I wanted to make my Negroni. First of all, Campari is gone. I can't use Campari. I want to make my Negroni. I need my bitters. I have my vermouth and I have my gin. You know? So I had yeah. to with bitters. I told you before we were distilling almonds. When you're, when you're ever in Spain uh, in springtime, uh, the almonds, they, they are just formed. They're still very green. Yeah, in the month of May, beginning of June, if you pick an almond like that, you crack it open, there is this white fruity element inside. It's like a fruit. It's beautiful. It's very soft, very exotic uh, feeling about it. And the peel is very bitter. So we started to experiment and finally I came up with a destillate of these green almonds to extract my bitters. So for this Negroni, I'm using these bitters extracted from uh, green almonds instead of Campari. Yeah? I have to lower, of course, uh, the volume because it's way more intense. Yeah? Um, what does that do? This almond, well, Matt, if you smell this Negroni, what do you think of? Well, mm. well I smell sort of cola, a lot of cola. But I think that comes from the vermouth. But I do smell a sort of creamy nuttiness from the maybe from the almonds. Yeah, a little bit of marzipan, maybe. Mm, marzipan, absolutely. That's it. That's the almond. Oh, you see the impact of the bitters. Now my gin has twelve different botanicals, and my vermouth has about twenty-four different botanicals. These are all in this Negroni in one batch that I build it up. You know. I, I didn't want to make an imitation of a classical Negroni. I wanted to interpret a Negroni in a Spanish way, in a Mediterranean way. So you can make it at home with the gin, the vermouth, uh, with Campari, of course, or you can buy it just to relax. You don't have to buy anything else. Uh, chill it, you know, have Whatever a nice key. And you can uh, surprise your guests at any moment uh, serving an authentic Negroni. Again, everything has to be cold. My Negron is not chilled. So I'm gonna add some ice in my cocktail glass to serve it. Okay. So what is really, 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 really typical on a Negroni? Orange. Orange matches perfectly to a Negroni. In this case, I'm going to use uh, the peel because the phosphor is interesting me and I'm going to make a really generous white peel of uh, orange. You know, don't be scared to, to go with a big peel, you know, like really. So now when you turn it, you, you, you won't see it maybe now on the camera, but at home you will see it. You, yeah. see, you will see this phosphor coming out of the peel, you know, that's what we need. You want to make it beautiful, we're going to give it a twist. 
and just uh, twist it around your screw. So you're going to give it this twisted form uh, before we're going to put it in there. And that is, ladies and gentlemen, a classical Negroni without being classical in Spanish. Complexity of this Negroni is, wow, you know, this talks, yeah. to, this is, is, is going on all the time. That is fantastic, I have to say. If if you find um, Campari a bit uncompromising sometimes, if you find it a bit bitter, this is a little bit softer, isn't it? It's a bit more, there's more going on. It's not just the thing, you know, it's not just the bitterness. It's lots of things going on. I think that's great. Which is a cocktail, you know, which I believe also a cocktail should be, you know, uh, giving, giving it. But it's, it's very pleasant. Uh, you can drink it on its own. Actually, don't forget, my gin is really lovely, neat, uh, without tonic, without ice, without anything. Uh, because, you know, there is this complexity in it, that the richness in it. So you can enjoy it uh, like a chupito, you can enjoy it in the evening with a cigar, after dinner with coffee. You know, gin is uh, not just gin tonic, it's way more. No, everything, it's a joy. That's fantastic. Thank you, Stefan. Wonderful. Right, should we round the night off with the final uh, discussion point? And you couldn't have a, a cocktail night, a cocktail uh, session without talking about the martini, the, the most famous cocktail, the, maybe the king of cocktails, who knows? But it's quite incredible. The thing about martinis is there's so much uh, chat, so much discussion about martini, about one of the simplest drinks in the world. And, you know, it's crazy, isn't it, how nerdy some people become about the proportions and things like that. But um, let's, let's, um, let's do a quick martini and then, then we must move to the, to the questions before, uh, before the end. But um, it'd be great to, great to hear how, how, how you uh, make a martini with... Um, we're going to be using the Rambler 41 Vermouth, which is a lot darker than uh, you might otherwise make a, a martini with, isn't it? Um, uh, in that case, I'm going to use the other one. Uh, yeah. Where is the name? Oh, I opened this one. I'm going to do the okay. name with uh, the orange one. They both work and they both give uh, a kind of a different feeling of, uh, to it. Yeah. Uh, first step was doing that is chilling, chilling your glass. I got my glass in the freezer, you know, but it makes it easier. Yeah. You don't uh, uh, have to chill uh, at the moment. Uh, yeah. Much okay. easier in the freezer. So here comes the whole thing. Yeah, uh, of course, it's gin. We're going to start off with 60 milliliters of gin. Again, in your steering glass, we're going to steer it. Everybody remembers Mr. Bond's stirred, not shaken, please. Okay, we got 60 milliliters of gin. There are people that will say, this is it. This is my martini, you know, nothing more. Then you have people that will yeah. say, uh, okay, I'm going to add some vermouth flavor to it. And they do like this. That's it. That's right. That's, That's it. Just show the vermouth to the to the yes. gin, the, na the, the naked no, martini. No, 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 in there, you know. Then you yeah, have yeah. people that go like, uh, oops. That's it. Yeah. Well, it's a question of. Uh, I think there is a lot of macho thing going on. Like, don't put vermouth in my gin. I want it strong. I want that. You know, we go back to the. No, we don't go there. We're gonna make it much more gentle. Um, my standard recipe with this gin is 60 milliliters gin and 30 of vermouth. Uh, I call mm -hmm. it vermouth, you know, and in your case, uh, Matt, with the orangey, I would say 30 milliliters. With this vermouth, I would go only 20, you know. But yeah. again, it's both vermouths, darker. it's your taste, it's what you like, you know, find your perfect combination for a dry martini. Yeah. Of course, the less vermouth, the drier uh, the martini is going to be. You know? I found um, 
after sure. experiment, experimenting a lot, I, I found about 15 mils to be to be the sweet spot for me, but it's a, it's a total personal preference, isn't it? It's good. It's good. So now comes again the steering part. You know, at least 20 seconds, at least. If you want to go out 50 seconds, a minute, two minutes, go for it. Now, Stefan, you mentioned stirred, not shaken. That's the thing, isn't it? Uh, James Bourne coined the phrase shaken, not stirred, but which it's completely wrong. You should always stir your martini. <laughs> why well, why do you think uh, that was? Because he was in a hurry and he, he needed to make it cold very quickly before he went and killed some old baddies or something. You know, uh, what I explained before about the molecular structure, I really believe by stirring, you will open that structure much more than by shaking. By shaking, uh, uh, you have to shake longer, much more intensive, and you get the third ingredient coming in all the time, which is water. In this case, it's much more gentle, and the chemistry can happen between the two uh, spirits. Yeah. So, it's always good this, this tasting, you know? Because it's, uh, it's very simple, but it's probably the most complicated cocktail that Beautiful, beautiful color yours. Yeah, because I got a, a, a darker one. It's still, uh, you know, it's like orange. I love this color because it has this amber, uh, mm. gold, gold uh, feeling to it. You know? Okay, I'd like a simple lemon to add to it. I'm going to add it a little uh, twist. Again, the same as a Negroni. And then, of course, the classical olive. And olive that, as well. Lovely. That makes, that makes it really military. It does. Salute. Wonderful. Cheers. Excellent. Delicious. You know, they're all gentle in a kind of a way. You know, there is this um, a lot of people uh, tell me that my gin is feminine. Uh, which is a term it's, which is used in wine also to indicate when alcohol is not uh, or, or tannin Harsh. or, you know, when everything is smooth. What is feminine? Beautiful, smooth, lovely, uh, voluptuous, uh, and so on. <laughs> that's yeah. all there. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, that's been fantastic, Stefan. So, it's so interesting. Really uh, great. I love the more flavoursome vermouth with the martini. It adds a different dimension to the super dry, exactly. um, you know, clean, uh, clear ones. It's so that you can have some fun with vermouth, I think. Uh, that's been brilliant. Um, I'd love to move on to, we've got a, just a couple of questions in the question box, which we can fire through uh, pretty, yes. I think before we go to the questions, we're going to publish yes. recipes. Uh, you can call me when you're making them and you forgot to, uh, what to put in. But what I really recommend you, come to my bar, come to Barcelona, come to learn the cocktails here in front of me. Stefan's office. Uh... You people. Barcelona is wonderful and this door will always be open for naked wine people. Very welcome. So come and visit me and I show you in first hand how to make these cocktails. We look, look forward to traveling again when we, when we can and, and seeing, seeing your bar, your, your office. Uh, what a great office it is, by the way. Um, pretty phenomenal. Uh, wonderful. Um, so somebody, uh, Karen's asking, can you do a bit of Tom Cruise juggling, some um, flaring with the cocktail shaker? Uh, uh, this could go horribly wrong. Uh, I definitely can't. Uh, I am maybe not uh, <laughs> the real Tom Cruise, but, but I put uh, in bed something <laughs> and I put swing it around. Hey, there we go. 
No, what I like is, that's, uh, let's say, going this way. Wow, I'm going to put some eyes in it. Uh, I'm going to grab uh, a little bit of red wine. <laughs> shake it, shake it, shake it like it is our baby. Throw <laughs> uh, away the wine. I'm going to put in uh, some beautiful citrix. Uh, I need more ice to go along with it. <laughs> then the chin comes along and oh, it's pouring. Uh, hoppa! That was good as well. Put it on in, in the old way. If you don't like uh, carbon, well, just shake it, baby. Hoppa! <laughs> That's fantastic. That was, a, that was a lot quicker than the first time you made the gin and tonic stuff. <laughs> there you go. Nice. Phenomenal gin and tonic and a lot quicker than the first time. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah, everyone practice your practice your spraying tonic everywhere, all over your kitchens in your in your hometown. Um with, so uh, and then Karen's also asking which glasses do you recommend? Which glasses do you recommend for the perfect gin and tonic? I think we've already established that, haven't we? It's the, the, the balance of the wine glasses because of your gin is very wine orientated to, to bring out the aromatics. Especially the Bordeaux type wine glass. I think it's very good to make gin tonics with this uh, Mediterranean gin. Yeah, great. Um, brilliant. Um, some people keep vodka in the freezer to serve it ice cold. Could we do this with gin to get it really cold before we start, asked Caroline. Of course you can. Uh, one of the partners in my company is a very famous master of wine, which is called Norrell Robertson, a Scottish guy. Uh, he has an extreme... I know Norrell. Well, you have wines of him. You can taste them. He, this guy is an extremely good uh, palate. I was so pleased when, uh, when he joined my project because it means my gin is good, if he says so. Yeah. And um, uh, what was the question? Uh, can you keep it in the freezer? So this guy, Norrell Robertson, he keeps it in the freezer all the time, the gin, and just drinks it yeah. like vodka, uh, out, straight out from the freezer. Of course you can. Neat. Uh, neat. Yeah. But also to build up a gin and tonic. The colder your ingredients, your glass, loads of ice, it has to be chilled, chilled, chilled. So yeah. It's a very good way to go to put it in the freezer. I agree 100%. Um, on, that, on that note, actually, if you go to Duke's Bar off St. James's uh, for a martini, which I recommend, it's the one of the best martinis you'll get in London. Alessandro, the bartender who's been there for 20 years, he, the way he makes a martini, he keeps all of his gins in the freezer. He takes a frozen glass. He spritz his vermouth on the glass just some spritz and he pours the gin neat from the freezer. No, no ice at all. Just mix it in a glass then and there. So very strong, very cold martini, very dry. That's his style. And he only ever lets you have two of them uh, because they're so strong. And, uh, and I can vouch for the fact that you must not have more than two of them. Uh, and so I, re I recommend a trip to Duke's Bar if anyone's in London. It's, um, yeah. So there you go for the freezer. Absolutely fine. Alcohol at that strength doesn't freeze, does it? So, so you can go for it. Um, have I you got? I have to interrupt. I actually walk on three legs. <laughs> <laughs> so I always have three minutes. Uh, anyway. Fair enough. Fair enough. You can you can have three then. Just have to show Alessandro your third leg, probably, wouldn't you? Um, have you got a non-alcoholic gin for the driver? And why are non-alcoholic gins so expensive? Have you looked into this craze for non-alcoholic spirits? Mm, first of all, I think they shouldn't be. But why are they so expensive? Because uh, it takes a huge effort to get alcohol out of your spirit. Uh, yeah. I told you before, we, you need alcohol to extract aromas. Now, you know that in Coca-Cola there are rests of alcohol. You know that in, uh, uh, there are a lot of drinks in food. Uh, there is uh, everything which has aromas has been in touch with alcohol. European community considers that 1.2% alcohol is not considered to be mentioned. Uh, if you have yeah. a without alcohol, it might have 1.2%, it might have 5% alcohol. 
a case of, uh, of refreshing drinks. These are strains that are in there. You don't notice them. It's considered when you get one glass out of 1.2% alcohol drink, it reduces to zero, zero point, whatever, it's neglectable. Yeah? Uh, but I ask myself, why would you make a gin without alcohol? You know, uh, I, I'm working on something, uh, which is a new mm. method without alcohol. Is it gin related? Do I use botanicals? Do I do what I do with my gin? Yes. Uh, people that don't want alcohol, are they waiting for a gym without alcohol? I don't think so. I think they're, they're waiting for a rich experience without alcohol. Uh, mm. On a gym without alcohol, just lower the proportion. Only put 10 milliliters in it, especially this gym, because it's yeah. so intense. I saw Martini came out with a 4% alcohol gym. Uh, why is it so expensive? Because they use techniques uh, which cost a lot of money. And up till today, they only reached to reduce alcohol only 50%. If your wine is 40% alcohol, they control today the technique to bring it down to seven, not more. You know, if you want to bring it down to 1.2, how do you do this? I don't know exactly how they do it. I know how I am doing it. Uh, and it's all looking for a very high intensity and they test it because again, you need this alcohol. You can lower technically uh, the alcohol. You're going to lose aromas. You're going to lose freshness. Uh, for me, I don't know if it's really an artisan drink if you use those techniques of reducing. You know? So um, there's still a way to go when it comes to non-alcohol. Uh, there are first mm. non-alcohol drinks on the market. I believe it's much more for alcohol drinkers that shouldn't drink so much or that have to watch with their diets or whatever. And they are looking for lower alcohol products. But I also believe there's a consumer that just wants to enjoy a very rich drink, which is not, yes. which is not uh, something that we alcohol drinkers all have, you know, different options, yeah. different flavors, different tastes. I'm working yeah. on trying to deliver that uh, to those people, you know, to come up with something. Uh, it's expensive still with this, yeah. There is not uh, much demand. Yeah. And you know how it goes. No. Uh, it's exclusive still. Uh, the price is never a good indicator, really, of the quality. I believe. No. And why would you reduce the price? Because you're trying to create a premium experience. It's, it's the same sort of product. But I think the key with the, these sort of non alcoholic spirits, if you like, is just creating a product that tastes good that you don't want to. You don't want to guzzle. I think that's that's the key with those. It's it's creating a drink that feels like you're having a an, a strong drink, but there's no strength in it, and that's a really hard thing to do without having sweetness in it or something like that. Your sugar without having any of the sugar. But um, there are some interesting products out there. But um, I think trying to sort of make a gin and then take the alcohol that's not it's not the answer, is it? And um, the the last question for you, Stefan, is where is your bar? Oh, carry on. No, I was, I was, you said sweetness, you know, uh, alcohol, uh, a lot of alcohol gives a sensation of sweetness, which doesn't yeah. mean, you know, this, the, 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 the winter gin that we make, not the very, we, we use fig distillation and it has a very sweet taste in the nose. When it's dry, there's no sugar at all in it. So alcohol can produce this sweetness. Uh, my goal is uh, let's be all happy together with a nice cocktail without alcohol. Exactly. Without any problems, you know, like, uh, okay, let's go to the last. Uh, Just don't drink too many. And the, the final question is where is your bar in Barcelona? In, uh, where, Barcelona. Is, where, where are you? It is next to the. Where, whereabouts? Uh, you have, if you're in front of Barcelona, yeah, I'm in the sea now. Uh, on the left side, you have the, the cemetery and the, on the Montjuic mountain. It's a mountain with an old castle with the cannons uh, to protect the city. Then on your right side, yeah. you have the two new buildings uh, in front of the sea, Sagrada Familia. We are just behind this mountain, which in a valley, wow. which is called uh, Poble Sec. Yeah? Actually, uh, cities like Barcelona are very high. The barrios where everything happens changes every two, three years. When I arrived back in 91, Gracia was the place to be. You know? 10 years later, El Born 
wall came up uh, and the Alcoran, which is much more on the right side of the city, the port next to Barceloneta, that area boomed. And just before COVID, two, three years before, this barrio is booming. Uh, the, the Adrian, his brother, started up tickets here on the parallel. Uh, we have Kimet Kimet, uh, really beautiful uh, tapa bar with a beautiful wine collection. And more and more new residents of bars are trying to open in this area of the city. So it's hot here, uh, even at night, you know, when there's no sunshine. <laughs> yeah. Um well, you would put, maybe do a post on your wall as someone suggesting with your the address of your bar when, when we can all travel and get on a plane properly without filling out too many forms and papers. Um, maybe we can all come on mass and visit you. Uh, that would be fantastic. But Stefan, um, I'll leave it there. Thanks so much uh, for tonight. It's been fascinating. It's been uh, a lot of fun. I've loved the cocktails. I think the gins are fantastic. I'm biased, um, but I think our customers love them too. So thank you very much um, to uh, to everyone. Thank you for watching. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, you can head to Stefan's uh, uh, profile on the Naked website and find all of these products, loads of other gins, uh, vermouth, the Negroni. There you go. He's going to try if you can keep it on its head uh, for more than a couple of seconds. Um, so go and do that. And then uh, the next session uh, is on Thursday this week with my buddy Ray, who you all know, and he's going to be introducing you to some new winemakers that have just joined the Naked family. So everyone, I hope you join Ray then. Uh, but Stefan, thank you. Bit, thanks. You've been a legend as ever. Um, yeah. And I would certainly look forward to visiting you. Yeah. Great. Hello, thanks, mate. Uh, you're very, very welcome on this team. Matt. Uh... You enjoy your cocktails, I can see it. So uh, follow I've got it. them all lined up, ready enjoy to finish. Life, you know? <laughs> it's all about enjoying life. I love you, really. That's it. That's it. Thank you, mate. Okay. Cheers, everyone. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, my loves.